Ashley Thomason continues to enjoy an inspired theme park life. Her talents as a performer and her qualities as a person are uniquely tied together, making her a giving and engaged artist in her own right. On the eve of commencing a new contract with Tokyo Disney, we sat and talked a little about the journey so far. Okay, Ashley, thank you for sitting and joining me here for Park Life. It's great to have you here. Thank you for having me, Michael. Pleasure. Now, this is at a unique turning point in your career because we're about to lose you from Village Roadshow theme parks and you're about to move on to another role, but still within the theme park industry. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, so I'm leaving Village Roadshow. This is my fourth time leaving and I'm heading back to Japan with Tokyo Disney Resorts. So it'll be my fifth contract with them and something a little bit different again this time. When did you first start doing Disney and Tokyo? When did that happen? Yeah, so my first contract overseas with Tokyo Disney was in 2015. Um, and I did two contracts back to back. So I ended up being there for two and a half years in a decent chunk of time. Yeah. yeah. How did you find it? Was it a big culture shock or had you traveled before that particular trip? Had you I, been aware of the world a bit more? Yeah, I had traveled a little bit, not too much. I'd lived alone by myself since I was 17. So I was, I'm very independent. That part of it didn't necessarily scare me, but yeah, moving to a different country without my family was, was a little bit challenging at times, but yeah, I think I settled in pretty quickly. Yeah. yeah. You've had a, a long career for someone who's still very young, so I'm keen to unpack that and, and go back a bit. Where did the passion for the arts happen? And, and can you remember at a, what time in your life that was? Yeah, so <clears throat> I, my background's in dancing. So I started ballet when I was four. <laughs> um, so I've been dancing pretty much my whole life since I can remember. My mum used to take me to dancing lessons and I would cry. And so she stopped taking me and she's like, you, you're not enjoying it, like we'll stop going and then I get more upset when I couldn't go. Um, so I guess I eventually, you know, <laughs> moved away from those sorts of emotions. I did really enjoy it. Um, and yeah, so from, from there I ended up training full time with my ballet from when I was 14. So I was doing ballet in the mornings with Queensland Ballet Academy and then I was doing my schooling up an afternoon wow. um, up until I was 17 and then I moved to Melbourne to continue full-time study and then um, I t actually took a bit of a break from performing mm. um, for a couple of years of my life um, realized I really missed it and then got back into it and that's when I end up in theme parks so it's definitely been a part of me performance definitely mm. my whole life but my background is dancing what is it about dance as a as an art form and I'm sure other dancers could probably articulate it in a similar way, but what is it about that form of artistic expression that yeah. makes you passionate? What is it? I do love that it, it is a way of expressing myself. Yeah. Ballet in particular is a very disciplined art form, um, which I absolutely love. And I think any performer can relate to this, the fact that we're always striving for, for, for perfection. It's something we're never going to achieve, but it makes us push more because we want to be better. We want to continue to upskill. Um, and, and I think that's really why it appeals to me so much. I just want to continue to become a better version of myself, um, whether it's in my personal life or professional life. You said that beautifully. If I could just interject there, I'm glad you said that because I only just a moment ago today was in a conversation with someone about the arts and the expression of acting. And the same idea, there is no arrival to the point where you've at the top of the mountain, there's nothing else to learn. I've mastered the craft. So the point is you're seeking perfection, accepting that perfection cannot be attained, but the journey of seeking it grows you, makes you sharper, makes you greater. Yeah. But that's also beyond the art form, that's the lesson in life. That there are no perfect people and seeking to find a perfect person or make yourself a perfect person uh, may not be possible. But if every year you are slightly more evolved, more aware, more empathetic, better version of yourself than you were a year ago, maybe that's the point. Yes. That I'm, I'm continually improving by the seeking of perfection. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So when you took that break from dance, what, what motivated that? Because it seems like it was a big part of your life. Could you tell us a little bit why you took a break? Yeah, so dancing was always a huge part of my life. I guess I spent a lot of my nights when I, like finishing school, I'd spend my nights at a dance studio, I'd spend my weekends at a dance studio, and I turned 18 and I met a boy. 
And of course, it was, it was a brand new thing to me because I'd spent so much of my life dedicating myself to my art form, to my passion. Yeah. Um, and I met a boy and, and my life changed. Yeah. And I guess, yeah, I explored that for a little bit, but yeah. I found that when I stopped dancing, when I stopped performing, that there was a part of me missing. You know, I, I was missing something and, and it took me a few years to realize what it was that I was missing. And um, when I realized that, I went back into it and that's, I just started applying for anything mm. within the industry um, because up until that moment, I'd, I'd done my training and I'd been in an amateur ballet company and that was about it. Mm. I never really done anything professional um, within the field. So yeah, that's what kind of got me back into it. You don't seem like someone that's been unafraid to back themselves. Have you yeah. been pretty fearless most of your life? I guess so. I think confidence is a huge thing within the industry. Um, me, myself, I'm a very shy, reserved person. Mm. Um, but when it comes to my job, I can't be that person. Mm. You know, I, I do have to reach within and find something to make me a more confident version of myself, which I am a confident person, but if I'm portraying a character, I'm up on stage, you know, it requires that extra effort. Mm. Um, yeah, so I guess I just have to find it within myself sometimes, but mm. it's definitely something you need within the industry. You need mm -hmm. to back yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm a big believer in manifestation and dreaming big. And I like to think that, you know, everything that has come my way, yes, I have worked hard for, but I've believed in myself and, and I've made it happen. Absolutely. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So the one thing I'm, I'm, I'm curious about with uh, that strong sense of independence, does that come from living alone, getting comfortable with knowing who you are and where you want to be, that's kind of built up some resilience as well? Most definitely. I'm the youngest of three children and I guess being the youngest, I kind of was given the most freedom. Mm. So I think that's where my independence started, moving out of home so young. Um, you know, I just became very comfortable with myself. I'm very happy being by myself. Mm. Um, I know exactly what I want and what I don't want. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I, I know exactly who I am as a person. And so I think that's, yeah, a stem of my confidence. No, it's fantastic. Can you tell me, what, what, what is it about the theme park life for someone that had that, that background with the ballet and the discipline of that world and making that transition into a theme park life where it's a bit more dynamic, a bit more varied? Yes. And you suddenly have to wear multiple hats and it's, there's more of, of an immediacy with the guest or an audience. What, what, what is it that you get benefit from as an artist by doing the theme park work? What does it give you? What does it give me? First and foremost, my job is so rewarding. I, I absolutely love that I can create magic for people because in return it creates magic for myself. I don't know if that's selfish of me to say, but I, <clears throat> I really enjoy that aspect of it. I guess coming from the ballet background, you're disciplined. So you, you use that within this industry, but you have to be so versatile. Um, the variety that we get within theme parks is huge. Um, the events that we have, the characters you can portray, um, everything. So, yeah. When you jump out of a park like Village Roadshow theme parks, whether it's SeaWorld, and we'll get to that in a moment, and that part of your journey, and then more recently Warner Brothers Movie World, and then you find yourself doing Disney. When you get to the, a, a Disney park, can you immediately feel that, I guess, every park even here, SeaWorld has its own energy, its own culture, and its own vibe. You come over to Movie World, it's a different tone again. When you get to Disney, can you tell us in, in some detail what the roles were that you were playing and what was unique about them that separated the Disney experience from being here? Yeah, so I want to first say that I love I love everything park I've worked in. They're all uniquely different, as you said. Um, in, in Japan, working for Tokyo Disney Resort, I've done a few different things. So I've portrayed face characters. Um, can you name a few for us? Yeah. So or are you not supposed I've, to name a few? Well, I can let you know that I've shared the stories of Wendy Darling, Alice in Wonderland, Tinkerbell, Snow White, uh, Rapunzel, um, just to name so a few So they're stories favorites. that you've shared in exactly. that Disney experience? Yes. Yeah. Um, I love sharing those stories. Yeah. Um, I've also done a dancer contract there, performing on the stage. I was an aerialist. Wow. as well so i was flying throughout disneyland with peter pan Crazy. which was amazing yeah um so yeah there's those aspects that i did over in japan which were different to what i've done at movie world to what i've done mm. at sea world um and i've loved i've loved every adventure that i've had mm. what, what do you find when you're in japan for example and from a culture perspective i think that 
all people of all race and backgrounds. I did a little bit of work in China with Lionsgate in a theme park there. That was all new for me. And I found even talking to the creatives in China on that project, we couldn't share language, but we could share creative language. And I was co-producing some content for that park with non-English speaking Chinese creatives. But through expression of hands and expression of tone, we would say, you know, this needs to be, mm, wow, he walks here, he comes over here, he does this. And we would physically, and then there'd be this recognition in each other's eyes and a laugh of yes, yes, yes. And I realized there's a creative language culturally yes. that transcended a verbal language. And I found that fascinating. Yes. Did, did you find equally in Japan that there was almost this other language that creators have? Yeah, definitely. I'm thinking back now to when I would do meet and greet situations and interacting with guests, you know, I'm coming from an English speaking background, they're coming from a most of the time Japanese speaking background. Um, and my Japanese is minimal, their English is minimal. So you're essentially you're giving the greeting, but at the same time, you're yeah, you're almost putting on like a mime and you're, you're bringing up keywords that they might know from the story you're portraying and you somehow come together and you're of an understanding of what's happening in that moment, um, which is really special to see. You do see it in, the, in their eyes. You're like, okay, they're on the same page as me and they understand this interaction and they're having a good time. So yeah, even if it's not through language, if it's through um, body language or, or, or whatsoever, but they, they understand, there is an understanding. Mm. I think that art in all its forms is the, the common language of humanity. Yes. And then once it's expressed in whatever form it's expressed in, if it's pure and if it's authentic, that connects people. Even if language can't do it, that's the great thing about good art yeah. and being an artist. And it, I guess it can be tough too, because particularly in the last couple of years that we've had and the way the world is now, more than ever people are looking for human connection, escapism. How is that for a performer when you might have your own things going on in your life you've got the same kind of pressures that everyone's recently shared with COVID. So you've got your own stresses, but you find yourself in a role where you're expected to take people away from theirs. What's that like? Yeah, as a professional, I like to kind of keep it at the door. You know, everyone's going through a hard time, especially at the moment, as you said. Um, for me, I do take my job very seriously. It's an honor to be able to help people escape reality, which is essentially what they're doing when they're coming to a theme park, um, whether, they're, whether they're having a great time in life at the moment or not. Um, so it is, it is my responsibility to give them that great time and to help them escape and forget about whatever is going on. Um, so for me, I, I, I definitely try to put any kind of personal issues that I am having, if I am having them, at the door. When I walk through those gates, you know, I'm still myself, but, I'm just trying to be a better version of myself to help others. Mm. I think that's a, a big thing for me is to take a step back and realize that there's a bigger picture and I'm playing a small part in making someone else's day great. That's yeah, beautifully said. Who or what inspired you or continues to inspire you in terms of, was there someone you watched, someone you listened to when you were much younger that maybe gave you a flash of, ah, oh, I could aspire to that, or was it? <laughs> Any, anyone in particular? Or? I guess I don't have anyone in mind that inspired me within like the industry. Mm. Um, my, I did watch my parents work very hard um, when I was growing up to provide us with everything they possibly could to give us great opportunities. Mm. Um, and so they are very inspiring to me in that sense that um, I want to work hard to give myself those opportunities still to, to explore new places. Um, and new avenues and and so I think really it stems down to yeah watching my parents provide for me and give me the best po possible opportunity in my life yeah yeah oh, that's that's a terrific answer too <laughs> and when you when you find yourself coming back from Disney and you you've done this now a couple of times where you're hopping back and forth when you look ahead and do you have a sense of where you might eventually land do, do you have a picture of yourself going forward in the arts yeah so I guess I've been doing this for nine years now and I still do absolutely love it. And I guess each time I come and go, there's a sense of me that's like, oh, maybe this is the last time. And I'm always content with that because I, I do like to think I, I give it my all. Um, any day could be my last and I, I definitely live like that. So each time I come and go, I, I do think, 
you know, maybe it's time to move on and I have studied and I have other avenues I can explore when this is all done. But if I can remain within the theme park entertainment industry, I would absolutely love that. Um, I obviously love the performance side, love the creative side. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have anything in mind in particular of where I want to end up, mm. but to remain within the industry would be incredible. Yeah, yeah, terrific. Look, we can't, I can't sit with you and talk about things and not talk about Beauty and the Geek. Yes. <laughs> so we, we obviously know that that was uh, a terrific time for you, I think, by, yeah. for those of us that checked in. And you know, we're watching at home every week to follow your journey. And can you tell us a little bit about how that came about? Uh, what motivated that? And then what that experience was like for you both during and when you came out of it? Yeah, so I moved home from Japan in September of 2020. My contract was terminated due to what was happening within the world at the time. Um, and I came home and it was the first time in my life as an adult that I just felt lost. I didn't have a purpose anymore. Well, at least I felt like I didn't have a purpose. I wasn't creating magic for people and and I didn't really know what to do. I wasn't studying. I did later go on to study pathology collection, but mm. at the time I wasn't studying, I wasn't working. And I was just at home watching TV and this ad came up for Beauty and the Geek. And I remember watching it years ago and I thought, why not give it a go? Yeah. You know. I was open to absolutely anything. I remember doing my application online. I didn't even finish it. I just saved and exited it before I did the video, before yeah. I finished most of the questions. And I got a phone call within like two hours. And they're like, we, we love what we've read al already. Can we Zoom with you tomorrow? Yeah. And from then it, it really snowballed. It happened so quickly. Um, it was a great experience. Absolutely would do it again in a heartbeat. For those that may not be aware of it and, yeah. and who are listening in, can you give us a quick synopsis yeah. of what the concept of the show is, just for those that may not be aware? Yeah, so Beauty and the Geek is a social experiment. It, at least in my season, it brought 10 beauties, which were females, and 10 geeks, which were males together, partnered in couples, and basically you compete in challenges that are outside your comfort zone, um, and the main goal is to help each other. You know, if there's a love interest there and it's and it and it grows, then that's great. If it's just a friendship, that's great too. Um, and then it, there's kind of eliminations throughout each episode. So if you don't do so well in a challenge, you get put up for elimination. And then at the end, you kind of have your winners that have just mostly had the most growth out of the entire experience, grown together as a couple, grown as individuals, and are a great representation of the whole experience. What did that experience do for you? Because I imagine, were you isolated together for a period of time? So isolated as in like as the group? Yeah, were you yeah. all sort of put in a situation where you're sharing an apartment yeah. building? And, yeah. So <clears throat> to begin with, before filming started, we had a week's worth of isolation just with another um, contestant, contributor. So I was partnered with another beauty. Um, we got to know each other very well. She actually works out over in LA. She's a red carpet reporter just such an inspiring person to be around. Um, and then while, while we were filming, we had roommates as well. Um, yeah, so it, we really got to know each other well one-on-one, -on -one, but then when we were in the group setting too, it was great to see everyone interact with each other and your partners and whatnot. What did you learn about you during that Me. time? It's a hard one because I definitely gave it my all and I definitely, definitely gave my partner my all as well because I really wanted to bring out the best in him. In terms of me, I think I'm still looking back and reflecting on, on how I'm better as a person. I definitely think that doing the experience, I've come out as a better person and, and I like to think that I was a positive role model. Mm. Um, I think I'm a lot more patient with myself because mm. doing the challenges, although they were out of my comfort zone, I did find aspects of all the challenges to somewhat reflect on what I've done for a living or throughout mm. my life. And I've got to ask you in that space, it's only that you say <laughs> that I'm reminded of it. Those challenges could go from the bizarre to the completely bizarre. Oh, yes. <laughs> there was a wrestling challenge, there was, wasn't there? yes. I didn't catch the ep, but I did see stills. Yep. Can you tell us about that particular challenge yes. and what that called on you to have to do? Of course. So a little bit about me. I When I applied for the show, I didn't know if I was going to be cast as a beauty or a geek. Because there's a bit of geek in you? Because there's a lot of geek in me. <laughs> I love gaming. I love wrestling. I love blood sciences. Like I, I 
have a lot of geeky aspects. That's great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so growing up, I was a huge WWF fan, which really? is now WWE. I would yes. never have picked that. My first ever crush was um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson when he was a wrestler. Wow. Um, yeah, so big fan. Um, so when we walked in and we saw that wrestling ring, I was so excited. I brought this up because I thought that would have been the most foreign thing you would have wanted to do. No. It's so, the opposite. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. Like, there were so many aspects of the challenges that I was like, oh, this actually kind of sits well within me. Wow. <laughs> but it was, it was daunting to see yeah. two grown men up there wrestling. Like, it was insane. And it was definitely a challenge because it's it was tag team. We had to get our acting yeah. out on show. Um, and... Yeah. You created a character too. <laughs> we did. An alter ego. We had to what create was your, a character. What was your alter ego? So my alter ego was Angel and right. my partner's alter ego was Demon. So we were a, a partnership, Angel and Demon. Um, we were like, what's something that we can really, you know, it comes easily. My partner was very much into acting um, and he was like, yes, I want to portray this like demonic character. I'm going to do these funny like hand and, and mouth movements. And I was like, great, you do that. I guess I'll just try and be angelic and bring out that, I don't know, that graceful kind of side of me. Yeah. Um, and we ended up winning that challenge, which is which is really great. How, um, I'm going to ask you, how are you graceful when you're in a wrestling ring? <laughs> how do you win with I grace? Mean, I was definitely not graceful when I jumped off the rope to right. like kind of... <laughs> I did, I can't even, is it a cross body fly, I think it was called, yeah. to like pin down my opponent. I don't know if that was too graceful, but... Um, but when you I, won. When, when, when I got up, yeah. <laughs> I was grateful in that moment. <laughs> that's fantastic. And obviously that, that show generated a lot of love and, uh, and a big audience. Yeah. And what was the, the social connection like with Complete Strangers? Did you find you were suddenly now under a bit of a light and there were people sort of coming out and, and commenting, asking questions? What did that do for you? Yeah, so coming out of the experience, um, like we filmed in the February, March, April, and it wasn't aired until I think the July. So it was this massive secret that I kept to myself for quite some time. Yeah. And then I remember being at rehearsal here for an event um, at Movie World and I got a text message and someone was like, I just saw you on TV, on a, like an ad for a TV show. And I was like, oh, I guess it's starting. Um, and the overwhelming response of positivity was just incredible. Um, there, there of course was, you know, you get your negative comments every now and then, yes. but it was mostly such positive, um, yeah, overwhelming response that I received from people, which was absolutely lovely. Yeah. Um, I don't so much get recognized on the streets or anything like that, right. but I, you know, every now and then I'll be out shopping with my sister or my niece and someone will come up to me and be like, I just want to let you know I saw you on that show and you were lovely and yeah. Isn't um, that great? And it, it's such a nice thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, yeah, I did do that. Like, I, I do kind of forget about it sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it, yeah, it's lovely to hear everyone's positive comments and kind words. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you were terrific on it. When um, when you go through an experience like that and you're sharing it with, uh, with other people, uh, is there a bond that happens after that that has remained? Absolutely. I, I almost compared it to when I've done contracts overseas because your friends become your family. You don't have your family there in that moment. So the people that you're surrounded by become your family. And that's exactly what happened during Beauty and the Geek. Um, there's 20 of us and we all became this massive family. We have a group chat and we speak on it almost every day. Mm. Um, even if we're not speaking on it, we're, we're checking in with each other and reading every, everyone's messages. And yeah, I, I guess I wasn't expecting that from the experience. I, yeah. I definitely knew I was gonna have an impact on someone and they were going to have an impact on me but to have a whole group come together it really is very special and i'm, yeah. I'm grateful for that because it's not something i expected at all no that's fantastic yeah. the um thing i was curious about when you you described before there was that period where you had to kind of reinvent because um you were looking to i think it was the COVID period that kind of locked yeah. you out a little bit how have you gotten through adversity? And I think for performers too, there can be challenges with the the roller coaster nature. Excuse the the, the pun, but <laughs> it's a roller coaster nature. Yeah. Whether you're in the arts within the theme park game or just on the outside, uh, whether it's your acting or your dancing, it can you know big troughs and also big highs, and then plateaus. Yeah. You know, there's eternal summers and winters and autumns and there's all these seasons. 
when you've gone through those spells and faced adversity, how how have you navigated through that that other people in a similar field might take a little bit of inspiration from? What, yeah. What's pulled you through? I guess, especially doing contracts, you do, you, you commit to a certain length of time and then you come home at the end of it, not with nothing, but you come back without a job or mm. perhaps without a house or, you know, um, so it's a, it's a very big realization and it's the reality of it. Um, I guess for me, I've had a great support network when coming home, which is great. But for me personally, I love the phrase, this too shall pass. Yes. Um, I always try to remind myself of that. You know, when I am ever down, I try to remind myself that this is temporary and you are very much in charge of your future and, and what you make of it. So like I said, when I came home from COVID, I went into study because I, at the time, didn't have a job and I was a bit lost and I was like, what can I do to improve myself? Pathology collection was something that I'd always been interested in, but I'd never really had the time to commit to because I'd been doing contracts or permanent work. Um, so in that space of being lost, I was like, you know what? I have this spare time. I'm going to use that in a very useful way. And so I went and studied. So I guess for me to get through those hard times is to really focus on myself and and realize what's important to me and mm. how do I want to make myself a better person and use that time to do that mm. and know that it's going to pass eventually if I'm feeling down mm. um, and to really, if, if I need the help of others, to really seek that support because I've always received it. Yeah, you've got an incredible degree of self-awareness. I remember sitting in a, the back of a taxi in Orlando when we were at the time researching for what became Hollywood stunt driver at Movie World yep. in the first version. And I was in the back of a cab with a fellow that was driving maybe mid seventies. And we were just talking about life. And I don't know, just got in this cab and suddenly we went deep. We were talking about life and I, he was taking me from one hotel to another hotel. Anyway, I just asked him a question. I said, what's the biggest lesson and learning you've ever gotten? And he looked at me through the rear view mirror in the car and I never forgot it because it was the first time I heard it and I, the second time I've heard it's you saying it now. He said, I wish I had known back in my 40s the line that this too shall pass. And he was in his 70s. And he said, I only came to really understand that in my late 60s. And he said, it's freed me from worry about things. I just wish I had less of that worry that I carried when I was younger. And I remember I took that line then and made it my truth as well. This too shall pass. Oh, it's, a great, it's a great line. Yeah. And it's also truth for all of us, regardless of culture, regardless of environment or situation. It's true for all of us. Yeah. It's great that you've got that awareness uh, at, the at the time you have it. Where does that come Thank from? You. Where does that awareness come from for you? I don't know. I, know. I guess I've never really thought about it. I guess I... I have been in a very lucky position that I haven't gone through too much hardship or stress in my life. Um, but in the moments where I have, I, th I guess that's where I learnt it. Um, I learnt that things are temporary. Um, I think a big thing for me, like I was with someone with for many years and just because of the life I was living with contracts, it just wasn't working out, living in completely different time zones. and. And that was a, a huge impact when that ended. And it was one of the first times in my life that I took a step back and I was like, at the end of the day, I'm here for me. I've got my back. And if I'm gonna improve my life, I have to do it. Mm. And I have to recognize what's working, what's not working. And, and every, every situation is temporary and, mm. and I'm gonna make the most of it. I'm, again, just in the last couple of days, been talking about um I was this morning in a call with a good friend of mine. Uh, we were talking about uh, you can't make peace with others truly until you've made peace with the person in the mirror. Yeah. That's where it starts. If there's no peace with the person in the mirror, there can't be peace with anybody else. Yeah. You're going to take true. something into all of those interactions. But the quest is to make sure the person in the mirror is at peace with the person looking back. Yeah. You, know, you seem to be instinctively doing that. What motivates you now? What still gets you up? What still makes you feel like I'm going to jump on a plane, I'm going to change my life again and start a new chapter? Where does that come from? Because you don't, feel, you don't seem like to be slowing down. What, what still drives you? What is that? My motivation, I guess, 
as I said, as a performer, it's it's continuing to upskill, it's continuing to strive for that perfection mm. that we're never going to reach. Um, but as as a person, I think growth mm -hmm. is the biggest thing. Um, so for me to just pack up and leave my life, yes, it's scary. Absolutely. Am I going to mm. miss everyone? Yes. Um, my family is everything to me. So for me to make that sacrifice mm. every time, is it's huge. But if it means that I get to grow as a person and professionally, and of course I'm going to do it. You know, I, I want to give myself the best possible outcome of this life. So that's really my motivation is that is seeking that growth, mm. whatever it may be. I was talking with some kids the other day in grade six at a leadership retreat. And we talked about there's two ways to live. We can live fear filled or fearless. And it's a choice. And we then talked about how you come into the world fearless. That's how you're born. It's your birthright. Yeah. You don't come into the world afraid to be in the world. It's the opposite. That's why you dream big exactly. as a kid. And you think it's all possible as a kid. But that's deliberate. That's how we're hardwired. So the trick is to remember how I was born, what's my birthright, rather than learning fear, learning self-doubt, learning to second guess, and ingesting all of that noise. Yeah, that's it. Like mm. I... Reflecting back on Beauty and the Geek, the wrestling challenge, I think I made four-year-old four year Ashley so proud in that moment. I think back to like four-year-old Ashley that's dressed up on the trampoline in a fairy costume and then what I've done over in <laughs> Japan, like I've yeah. made her so proud. So yeah. it is, you, yeah, definitely as a child you are fearless and I hope that I'm striving to continue to be that way. Yeah, You've got to keep that child alive. Yeah. Particularly in this business. Yes. <laughs> if you had to pick a, a favourite memory, I'm sure you've got a a wealth of memories that impacted you. Just one that stands out on your journey that you could share with us that had a real impact. A real impact? Oh gosh, there's so many. I can only imagine. I guess I have one in particular here. It's, it's quite a sad story, but we had someone very close to us have a child um, who, was, who was unwell. And in that moment, we came together with a group of our strongest characters, our superheroes, and, and just gave our all for a meet and greet for this little child. And I remember standing in that room, and it's a great honor to wear a symbol on your chest that means something. Mm. And I remember being in that moment, and I said to this small child, I said, you are the strongest person in the room right now. Wow even though they were surrounded by the whole Justice League, yeah. all these strong characters that stand for something so powerful, this child that was going through so much, like it just really hit my heart, mm. like in that moment of like, why we do this and mm -hmm. what our characters mean. And yeah, that's, that's something that's always stood out to me is that moment. Yeah. Um, yeah just trying to remain strong when someone's going through so much mm. more than you are. What a beautiful line you had that you said. Yeah. What a beautiful line. And that, that only came to you, to you because you're completely present in the moment. Yes. And then the thing that needs to be said can be said. Yeah. Because you're there, you're yeah. present with that person. Yeah. That's a really wonderful thing. I've again been in and around theme parks most of my life. And I don't know, I've said this to you, I think from for me, you're one of the most consistent performers I've ever encountered. Thank you. Just in terms of presence, authenticity, choice, commitment. But then on the flip side of that, one of the quietest people I've met in terms of, you haven't been quiet here, which is great. <laughs> You've been the opposite, but you're not noisy about the fact that you're in the world. You're just in the world doing the work. Yeah. And those are usually the artists that are the most pure in whatever they're doing because they don't need to be noisy because it's not about the noise and all the desire of the ego, as we can hear that by just listening to you here this afternoon or this afternoon being in the real time that we're, we're recording. Uh, you're completely present and you understand that this is an act of giving, that the real art of the performance is the art and the act of giving. Exactly. Not taking. Yes. Or saying, watch me. Watch me do this for you. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. So there's obviously still a lot ahead for you. When do we see you over at Disneyland Tokyo? When's that happening? So I actually leave in a week and a half. So I'm moving over the beginning of April right. 2022. 
Um, and so I've signed up to 12 months this time. Yeah. So we'll see where that leads me um, and see what adventures it takes me on, what I'll be doing. It's a bit all up in the air with, with COVID, um, yeah. you know, being short staffed and travel is difficult and whatnot. So I'm open to doing absolutely anything over there. Um, but yeah, very much looking forward to it. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to following your journey as it unfolds and everything mm -hmm. ahead. And no doubt when that contract ends, uh, there'll be more adventures and more chapters to write in your book. Of course. And who knows, you may even be writing another chapter of your book here in this beautiful park, which yes. is Warner Brothers movie where we're seated today. Any final thoughts before we wrap up here? No, I guess I, I did say this line when I exited Beauty and the Geek and it was just to tell everyone to dream big and be kind because that's what I live by. There's no better way to wrap this up than those last two statements. Ash, thank you for sitting down with me here on Park Life. It's been a real honour to have you here again, and it's been wonderful to capture a bit of your story here today. Thank you so much, Michael. Talk to you soon. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and share the Park Life podcast where you can. It all helps in raising the profile. Wherever you are in the world, keep safe, and see you next time.